When I was a kid, I didn't believe in superheroes. Now I do. What happened when, back then was when I would watch a superhero movie, my mom would get a towel, two clothing clips, and hang it on my back. And then at a moment, I felt like I was a superhero. I could feel in my body that I could run faster, I could jump higher. And all my neighbors were mutants, and all the kids were secret agents. And I would hit in the plum tree. And I wait for the perfect moment to save my family from the squeeze in the broom, in the garage. They're trying to take over the world. But then, the play was over. And the neighbors would be back to their normal lives. And they would do everything as everyone else and live the very exact same life. If that was a movie, they would be all extras. So when I watched a, a scene full of extras, I liked to invent their stories. This one here is Joe, one of my neighbors. He wanted to be an astronaut. But then someone told him not to leave with his head in the clouds. So now John is a supervisor in a factory. This girl, staring at nothing, is Jane. She was born to be an artist. But today, she sums up her life cleaning her house with a skiji and the broom because the brush and the paint were left behind at some point of her adolescence. You see, these are the kinds of stories that I grew up watching. A lot of dreams, a lot of good intentions. They just fell by the wayside because people needed to fit in this standard of society, this linear life that, that we impose upon each other. There was no movie on the TV about Joe, about Jane. There was a movie about Neil. The guy that had a gun pointed at his head and he would dodge bullets. The guy who would save the world. This guy was a superhero. This was the guy I wanted to be. But who was I at that moment? I was a guy that wanted to conquer the world by playing the guitar. Someone told me this was crazy. So I became a frustrated engineer instead. Who here is an engineer? Bad choice. <laughs> That made me wonder, what is the difference between Joe and Neil? Why were the stories that inspired me in movies, but not in my neighborhood? What did I need to do to become a superhero? I started studying superheroes. First one, Neil. The guy is the chosen one. He has a prophecy behind him. I was never the chosen one for anything, besides when we were playing football at school. I'm from Brazil, we play a lot of football there. And I was so bad that I was the chosen one to stay on the bench. <laughs> that never met, made me feel I had a prophecy to fulfill. So okay, I couldn't be new. Next one, maybe Superman. The guy is, is strong and he can't fly. I tried once, I was four or five. I climbed on a chair and I jumped. To reach my mother, I didn't. And I hit my chin on the floor. There was blood all over. People screaming, at I can't fly. There is Frodo from Lord of the Rings. This guy is more similar to me. You see, he's short, he's thin, he can't fly. But he carries on his chest the most powerful artifact in the, in the world. I carry with me my, my keys, my phone. I don't have anything powerful. But then, ladies and gentlemen, is when came the discovery. If you don't have a prophecy, if you cannot fly, if you don't have a magical artifact, don't worry. What I figure out is what can actually turn you into a superhero is a chicken sandwich. <laughs> I'll tell you how. But first, let me tell you a story. In 2007, in a car accident, I lost my memory. I hit my head against the window of the car and affected a part of the brain that is responsible for your short-term memory. 
That meant that I had forgotten completely what had happened in the, poor, in, the, in the previous four to five years. So I had this fascinating experience of other people telling me what I was doing with my life. And the first one was a friend. He was in the hospital with me. I can't remember his words, but what I understood that he said was, man, you played the guitar and we have a band together. We're playing some places, we are starting to, to get good at it, and we just enjoy this a lot. I asked him if, you, if I was good, and he said, yeah, man, you can play Switch Out of Mind from Guns N' Roses. I said, this is badass, I like it. He said, yeah, man, but you left two years ago. And, my, and the next one was my dad. I don't remember exactly what he said. But in my head was something like, Son, I really, I really hope you get your memory back as fast as you can because you are doing super good in life. You are studying day and night to become an, an engineer. It was my dad's dream. It was not mine. You wake up very early in the morning, you study. In the afternoon, you study. At night, you study. In the weekend, we're there with your books and a calculator. Guess what you do during vacations? You will study. <laughs> You will keep doing it, so that you get a, a very safe, normal job, We have some money, and then you build a family, raise kids, you make sure that they will do exactly the same things you did, and you have a very safe, normal life as any, anyone else. I look at, is this what I'm doing? This is shit! <laughs> I, don't, I don't want this! It's very interesting when someone tells you what you have been doing with your life. So from that moment, I decided I wanted to do something more meaningful. Something that gave me some sense of importance. It was when I joined an organization. It opened a branch, a local branch, of a global organization called ISIC in my hometown. What we do in this organization is fantastic. We get young, young people, university students, and we find projects for these people in other countries. So just imagine you today, after this event, you go home and you pack your stuff because tomorrow you are going to Kenya. There you will work in a social project or in a company from anywhere between one month and a half and one year. With one flight, we change all the conditions and all the circumstances of your life. The culture is different. The language is different. Everyone you know is not there, is here. Everyone there is someone that you don't know. What you eat is different. Where you, where you sleep is different. What you do is completely unknown to you. When you come back, you are messed up. And you are thinking now, what, are, what is the kind of impact that it can generate on society? Now, when you come back, things are different, not because they changed, but because you did. You develop leadership skills, and you are thinking on how you can increase your positive impact on society. Now you do this with, with many, many, many young people around the world, and the result is that I have a whole generation of people ready to change the world to a positive manner. In 2011, I was the president of this local committee in my hometown, and it was fascinating. We had just started, and it was growing super fast. There was, for example, one girl from China that had crossed the world to, to come to my hometown and work for a social project. One of my best friends went to Turkey to teach English to, ki to kids with autism. He came back and said, is this changed my life? And I said, this is amazing. We are developing young people to get ready to impact the world in a positive way. But then my president term was about to finish in the, in the end of the year. Someone would take over my role, and I would come back to the university to finish my degree and get a normal job, just like Joe, just like Jane, who was happy with it. My family, my dad, exactly. My dad's dream was to have his son as a mechanical engineer. But one day I was in the office, and we were, see, we were taking a look at a map that showed in blue all the countries that 
Isaac was present in. And there were some countries that, specifically a, a whole in South America, that is Paraguay, where this organization wasn't yet present. And then someone dared to make the comment, hey, we started this, this local committee here in our city. Just imagine how crazy it would be to take this to a whole different country. When I heard that, my heart started beating faster. I had goosebumps all over my body. It was like I was taking a deep breath before a pre-fall. But it was the right idea in the wrong moment. It was what my parents would call a, a recipe for disaster. I hadn't finished my university, I didn't have money, I didn't speak any Spanish, I, I didn't know what to do, it was just a nice idea. But it bugged me. So I was confused and I got one of my closest friends and said, man, let's, let's have a talk. Let's, let's eat something. And he said, okay, let's, let's go to the shopping mall, what do you want? I chose my favorite snack, it was a chicken sandwich. And I started talking to him. I said, I have this idea. It would be really cool to take Isaac to Paraguay. It's the right idea in the wrong time. I don't know how to do it. I don't have money. I don't speak Spanish. Ah. He said, bro, do you know the story of Hercules? Imagine if it was about a very, very strong guy who received 12 labors that were greater than the potential he thought he had. So he said, this is crazy, this is too difficult. <laughs> he came back home, he finished his degree, he got a normal job. Who would remember his story? What difference would have made? One hour later, I was at home with my laptop open, studying the process that I had to go through to take Isaac to Paraguay. So I started talking to the, to the management of this organization. I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. What is the first step? They said the first step is study. We need a research. It's a, it's a business plan. Just study this country and show us that it has potential to receive our organization. And so I did. I started researching about the country. In one month, this project was done. So I called them again. They said, OK, what's the second step? They said, can you present this project? Of course. In two weeks, for all the leaders of the organization, I said, sure. In a conference in Kenya, I said, what? I didn't have money not even to go swimming to Kenya. But there is always a way. When you want something, there is always a way. There is a situation, and that is how you respond to it. I didn't want to respond as Joe would respond. I wanted to respond as Neo, as a superhero would respond. So I found a way. I, I went to talk to the dean of our university, and I was incredibly surprised when he said that he would help me with the tickets to go to Kenya and come back and present this project. And on the way back, when I was leaving his office, he shook my hand and said, is everything OK with your documents, with your vaccination, with your passport? And it was when I realized that I didn't even have the passport. <laughs> Say you want to change the world and you don't even have a passport, man. <laughs> Who here doesn't have a passport? You make sure that on Monday you get this started. <laughs> and uh, the process to, to get a passport done took two months. I had two weeks. Again, there is a situation that is how you respond to it. I started calling people. I called a friend that knew a cousin of a neighbor of someone that knew the chief of the police of the capital of my country. This chief of the police called the chief of police of my hometown and said, there's a guy there. He has a project in Africa or something. It's really important. Give him a space in the queue for a passport. When I got home, I received a call from the chief of the police of my hometown. Are you the guy who has a project in Africa? La, 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 la. Yeah, yeah, it's me. You show up here tomorrow at 5.59 a.m. and we're going to give you a passport. Three days later, I was looking at my picture in a passport for the first time. 
And one week and a half later, I was in the airplane. You know, feeling that pressure against the seat as it takes off. It was my first international experience ever. It was the first time inside an airplane. I was going all the way to South Africa and Kenya. And in Kenya, this is what I found. The conference is 600 people from 113 countries. I'm here. <laughs> and I presented the project to everyone. And the applause and the shouts of everyone had the sound of victory. The, the project had been approved, and I was allowed to move to Paraguay and start this organization from scratch. But I was alone. I couldn't do this on my own. So I needed to find other people that was as crazy as I am to leave everything behind and become a full-time volunteer for two and a half years. Finding these people is not that difficult. Difficult is finding who wants to go to Paraguay. It's not a country that everyone wants to dream of going to. So again, there's a situation that is how we respond to it. I made a campaign. Uh, in this conference, I took a label that said, we can make it happen, I am second Paraguay, and I made every one of these people take pictures with them and share on Facebook. And this is what happened. It became a huge success, made a lot of noise on Facebook, and a lot of young people started taking pictures saying, we can make it happen, I am second Paraguay, without even knowing what I meant. But they were supporting me. So there was a lot of noise, and some people got interested in joining the team. In one month, one month and a half, this initiative, had a song, had a slogan, had a logo, had financial investment, and I had a team of three other people that would leave everything behind, become a full-time volunteer for a couple of years with me in Paraguay. Everything was ready to become true. I was about to move to Paraguay. It was time to tell my family about it. Now, one thing that I have to understand is that my dad, he is the shyest person I've ever met. Wherever he goes, he meets friends and he makes other friends on his way back. But at that time, he was facing a very difficult health issue. He was just on the couch for two months. And the only thing that gave him energy to keep going was the fact that his son, would become an engineer in the following year. I had a bucket of cold water to throw over his head. And that was heavy. That to me made me ponder. And I said, I've done a lot of things. There's a situation that is how we respond to it. And here's how I will respond to it. I'm not going to keep this up. I've done a lot. I know if I stop here, someone will take this. And this initiative would one day exist. And then I closed my eyes and I remember that conversation about Hercules over the, the chicken sandwich. <laughs> and I remember the photos that I got from young people all over the world supporting the initiative. I took a deep breath. I sat beside my dad on the couch. And I said, Dad, next month um, I'm not living at home anymore. I'm quitting university in my last year. I'm moving to Paraguay. I'm going to be there for two and a half years as a full-time volunteer. Now, out of everything my dad could have said at that moment, all the words that he had in his mind, he spoke none. Because pain is expressed through words but disappointment is expressed through silence. He didn't speak to me for two months. Afraid and confused, but deep inside knowing that I was doing what was right, I crossed the bridge between Brazil and Paraguay inside the bus. I ended up there alone, not knowing anyone, not knowing how to speak Spanish, without money, and not, know, not having where to stay the first night. Very reckless, I know. But things started to pick up. I was passionate about it. It was the first time I was doing something meaningful. 
started making partnerships with university. Soon enough, he was on TV, on radio, and signing a, a contract with a, with a minister of the country. And things started to happen. Stories of people that joined this organization and went to other countries and started changing their lives. Stories like Tio, a very, very shy Paraguayan girl that took part in a project. She achieved the results that were beyond what she thought she could achieve, and that was mind-blowing. When she finished that, she said, I just took courage to start my own company. She started her own company making cakes at her home and selling over the internet. And a couple of months later, he, she went to Mexico to teach kids in a small community everything that she learned about leadership and entrepreneurship. And just like Tio, in two, two and a half years, 70 other young people from Paraguay were going to very, very far to understand more of themselves and coming back home to start changing the world. A lot of other people from the entire world were coming to Paraguay to do the same. And this thing became alive on its own. It was my time to go and I started traveling to many countries, to more than 20 countries, giving trains, sharing this story, and telling people what they need to do because they also wanted to do the same. One day, in one of these trips, I was coming back from Hungary, and I decided to call my dad from the airport to tell him that I had seen the snow for the first time, and all these achievements that had been happening. And guys, I remember this call as though it was today. On the other side of the planet, my, my dad picked up and he said, Son, I'm very proud of you. You did something that I didn't approve, but it was courageous enough, and now you're building things with your own hands. You are happy and doing something that is important for other people. <sighs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> The dream came true, the lives of young Paraguayan people were getting a little bit more <laughs> messed up. My family understood what I did and my dad was well. Out of everyone that likes superhero stories, I'm not the only one. This guy was called Joseph Campbell. He studied heroes and mythology for his entire life and he figured out that there is something very interesting about, about them. He wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The most interesting thing about this book is that he said that there's one thing in common between all heroes. It's not a superpower. It's not being born on another planet. It's a journey. Every single hero goes through this very same steps. Every single hero starts their journey as a normal person in a normal world. But then they receive a call to action, from mythology to Neo to Harry Potter is the same. It's either Gandalf knocking at your door saying, hey, you have the most powerful thing in the universe, go destroy it, or it's a letter from Hogwarts, or it's something that tells the hero there's more to life than what you're living right now. Go face it. What happens to the hero at that moment is that he refuses the call to action. He says, I'm not special. I don't want to leave my comfort zone. So he refuses it, but something makes him change his mind, and he crosses the threshold. He leaves his home and he goes to a magical world where everything is unknown. There he meets a mentor, there's someone that gives him a tool, that teaches him something. And then he starts facing a lot of challenges. That was what makes him stronger, up to the point that he faces crisis. It's that point of the story when the hero falls. In some story, the hero dies. But this is just an opportunity for him to be reborn as an evolved being. Rise up again and beat the villain. And when he beats up the villain, he finds a treasure. It's knowledge, it's power, it's recognition. It's something that he can share when he comes back home. Making it a cycle until he starts a new journey. Now in this journey that I had, I also found a treasure. And there I figure out three things about all superheroes. The first one is be at the edge of your reach. If you read the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know the concept of circle of concern. 
This is a place where everything we worried about is. Global warming, violence in your country, corruption in, in politics and all that stuff. That you want to be different, but you cannot change. What happens when you put your time and energy in something you want to be different, but you cannot change? The best you can do is complain. Here is Joe posting stuff on Facebook. But there's something smaller called the circle of influence. It's everything that you can reach, that you can change. It's volunteering for a project, starting a new project, teaching young people sports, starting a new skill. The magic is when you put your time and energy in your circle of influence, it expands. Here is Neil. He starts with something really small. And it progressively gets bigger until it gets to impact the whole world. Number two, the rock bottom is midway. The hero only achieves his victory after he falls, after he dies. Rocky Balboa trains the whole movie super hard. When he gets in the ring with Apollo, he gets beaten up and he loses. And he goes to the hospital. Now what Rocky Balboa does? Does he go back home, get a college degree and get a job? No, this is Joe. Rocky Balboa trains hard. He comes back to the ring and he beats up Apollo. If you are in your own project and things got really, really tough, this is just a sign that you are in the right direction. Number three, answer the call. I want to build a project, I want to build a company, I want to change the world. But I don't have money, I don't have time, I don't know what to do. Guys, you were born to be superheroes. For all their generations to tell your stories. There is one difference between Joel and Neil. It's not a superpower. It's a decision of answering your call to action. But you've got to pay attention to the simplicity. The portal that can take you to the life that you always dreamed about might not be in a magical artifact. But in a conversation with a friend over a chicken sandwich. Thank you very much.